We're looking at preventive church discipline. This is part three. Ephesians 4, and we want verse 15. The Bible says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Let's pray. Father, we come before You, Lord, asking You to help us. To please, Lord, teach us. We need you to be the teacher, Lord. I pray you'd speak through me and use me. God, help me to say what you'd have me to say and not to say anything that I shouldn't. Uh, but Lord, just help us to learn how to practice as a body church discipline in the preventative sense. Lord, before it ever has to come to bringing someone before this body. Lord, I don't ever want to do that. I'm sure one day we will have to, but I don't want to. And I pray, God, that we would all learn to um, just deal with it ourselves, Lord, and, and learn the means by which you've established for us to prevent it from ever even happening. Please, Lord, just give us wisdom and help us to follow your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, one of the greatest benefits and blessings we have as a church is each other. We can be such a blessing and encouragement to one another. That's what really all this is about. That's what the fellowship is about. It's all about that, us being a blessing and help and a benefit to each other. We have to see ourselves not as individuals, but as one. We should really look at each other like one loaf of bread. That's how we should see it. When you look at a, a loaf of bread, even if you buy a loaf and it's already sliced, when you take it apart, you can still see how it fit together so perfectly. But we don't want to look at, think of ourselves as a, as a sliced loaf. We want to look at ourselves as one complete loaf. And it's all just mixed together and, and fit together perfectly. That's how we need to see ourselves. That's the type of unity and fellowship we need to have. That's the closeness, the bond that we need to have is, is like that loaf of bread. That's even how it describes us. That's how the Bible describes us, is as that unleavened bread representing the body. That's what we are, and that's how we need to see ourselves. If we separate from each other, there's no strength or unity. There's really not. But if we're together, there's a bond. There's strength there, and that's what we need. United, we can strengthen, complete, and encourage each other. When we're united, this is why the fellowship is vital. It's a vital aspect of preventative discipline is our fellowship, the, the, the friendship, the unity, the love, the care, the concern that we have for each other. It's vital to us being a healthy church to preventive discipline, and we'll see how. That preventive discipline is maintained through the fellowship of church members. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So Christ is the head. Now here's where we get into it. From whom the whole body, now here it is, the whole body, not just some pieces of it, but the whole body, what does it say? Fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, and here's what it does. It maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. See, when we have that fellowship, when we're fitly joined together, compacted, every joint doing what it's supposed to, then we can edify itself, it, the body, in love. Church leaders cannot know every need. Therefore, the members must take an active role in the health of this body. That's why the fellowship is so important. Because you guys might see something I don't amongst somebody else and you say, you know what, they need some prayer. They need some help. Maybe you bring it to my attention. Maybe you just go talk to them about it. But this is why we need to have that fellowship. This is why it's so important to help each other, to encourage each other, because you can see something that I can't and we all take an active role. Why? Because we're all part of this body. This is our body. I mean, just like when we get sick or something, our, all, all Parts of the body start helping to mend that one part. I mean, just today at work, I am walking out the door. And as I'm getting ready to leave the, the shop area, I'm walking out. And I hear one of the guys go, ah, 
And he looks at me and he is, is freaked out. I mean, he's just got this look of panic on his face. And he just grabs his wrist and he walks. He, he's coming up to me. His eyes are like this. And I can just see. And I was like, what's wrong? Are you okay? And he's like, no, no, no. And I'm like, well, what's wrong? And he, 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 he just went like that and showed me his hand. And as I look at his hand, he's got a glove on. And then I start looking at it and I can see a nail head sticking on the top of the glove right here. And I look, I'm like, oh, he shot himself in his hand. And that's exactly what happened. He shot a nail, a nail gun. If you've ever seen like a real nail gun, it can shoot three inch nails. It's a, it's a powerful thing. You don't want to get shot by one. And it went, luckily, it probably hit the bone, but skid off it. I don't, we don't know exactly, but it didn't go through the bone. It hit the bone right here and went through and kind of just stuck through the skin and through his glove. And because it had his glove too, we couldn't really see what it was. So what we did is we, you know, I thought he was going to pass out. So I, I just, I grabbed his wrist and put my arm under him. And I said, don't look at it. Just follow, just let's go. Let's go sit down. And we took him in there. And what we did is we ended up cutting the head of the, the nail off. And then we sprayed it with antiseptic and we let him, he pulled it through. And as he pulled it through, then we pulled the glove off. And then we see the blood just started running down his hand. And what happened? His body kicked in right away. I mean, that part of that, that panic, that fear that was on his face, that's all his body jumping in to, to take care of this thing. The adrenaline starts pumping to keep him able to, to do what he needs to do. That's all part of it. And then as the blood started coming, then the body starts working. We got a problem and all of his body is there helping to, to, to fix the wounded part but the whole body fitly joined together and compacted helped to the edifying of itself in love. It began to take care of itself. I'm not saying we didn't do something, but you understand, you know, as soon as you get cut, you know, it starts sending, I forget what that stuff is that starts to clot your blood, but it starts sending all of that and starts taking care of things. You know, just the fact that we have pain, you know, pain is a good thing. I know none of us like pain, but it's a good thing. If you didn't have pain, you'd just kill yourself. You would. You wouldn't know when you're burning yourself. You'd just stay there till your hand melts off because you don't feel pain. Pain's a good thing. It gets you, oh, ah, like that. And so that pain kicking in, his body was telling him, watch out, danger, danger. See, when our body's all working together, that's when it's the best. Even if something painful, hurtful does happen, it all kicks in to, to, to take up the slack. And this is why it's so important we have fellowship here and that we are that close knit, as the Bible put it, fitly joined and compacted Amen. body so that we're there for each other. We can help each other. We can encourage each other. The leadership within a church is limited in number and can't do everything that's needed for the edification of the body. The members must minister to one another day by day, every joint contributing its part. As we maintain fellowship and grow in love for each other, we will edify this body. If we do that, it'll just naturally happen. We're going to edify this body. As it says, for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted, that which every joint supplies. So when we're all fit in the body where, where God has put us and we're all doing our part, then the natural outcome is going to be to the effectual working in the measure of every part. See, it's effectual. When we are where we're supposed to be, God says it's going to be effectual. We're going to see some things happen, and I don't know if it means necessarily, it could be both is what I'm saying, so I don't know how God's going to do it, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be physical growth here numerically. It could be spiritual growth. It could be spiritual edification, which is sometimes, a lot of times, what has to happen first. you got to build the base before you can go up. Um, it could be that, or it could be numerical growth, but when we're doing what God wants us to do, and we're fit in our spot where we're at, God says it's effectual working in the measure of every part, and then it maketh increase of the body. So that increase could be spiritually or numerically, it could or both. I mean, but either way, it could go. Make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love, the building up of itself, the strengthening of itself, the encouraging of itself. And that's what happens when we're all doing our part. That's the amazing thing. God says, hey, I'm going to edify you just by doing what we're supposed to do. It'll be a natural outcome of it. That's what's going to happen. That's what, Just look at a child that grows and you see them and... and 
you maybe it's a year before you in between the times you see them and you see someone maybe once a year and you're like, wow, you have really grown. Why? Because just the natural things that happen in that body, they're going to grow. And if we will naturally do these things, if we'll naturally fit in our spot and, and, and do what we're supposed to do, then there's going to be the increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. It will happen if we're all doing our part. Every joint contributing its part. Edify means to build up or to strengthen. And that's what we need. That's what we want. We want to be a stronger body. I mean, that's what, what I want. You, you know, we don't have to, you know, you look at a human and they start as a baby and you know, you start off weak and then you grow and you get stronger. And then as you get older, it tends to go back down the other way. A church doesn't have to do that. It can just keep growing and getting stronger and stronger and stronger. It can do that. That is a possibility. And that's what we want. That's what we need. We'll, we can strengthen ourselves. Every Christian, therefore, has a vital part in maintaining the discipline of this church, or any church, but we're talking about this one. So every Christian, every member, has a vital part in maintaining the discipline of the church. Now when I say, let me be more specific, every member has a vital part. Because if someone's not a member, they're not a, a part of this body. I mean, you wouldn't expect someone else's hand to take care of your body. I'm not saying that we people don't help each other, but you understand what I'm saying. Your body takes care of you. And that, that's the point I'm getting across there. All of this is regarding the New Testament church body. Look at verse 10, Ephesians 4, 10. No, sorry. That's what I want. Go to Colossians 3. I skipped a part. Colossians chapter 3. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 first. So every member has a vital part in maintaining the discipline of the church. Members are to teach one another. Verse 16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, this is regarding the New Testament church body. Verse 10, it says, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Now look, we lay all that stuff aside. Everything outside of this body is laid aside. Why? Because we're entering a kingdom. All of it's laid aside when we come in here and we all come in equal. Amen. It's the priesthood of the believer. We're all equal. There's no Jew, there's no Greek, there's no circumcision, uncircumcision, no barbarian, Scythian, no, no slave, no free person. It doesn't matter, but Christ is all and in all. Amen. That's what it says. It's talking about the body, a New Testament church. It says, and have put on the new man. Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The new man. That's what we're declaring. I'm dead to the old man, and I'm going to walk in newness of life after the new man. What is that? I, I, when I come out of those waters, I am now a member of this church. I'm, a, I'm a, a, a citizen of the kingdom now. I'm a part of God's kingdom. All of that the, after the new man. And that's what it's talking about here in Colossians. It is through baptism we die to the old man and put on the new man. 1 Corinthians 10.32 goes right along with Colossians here where it says there's neither Greek nor Jew, uncircumcision uncircum nor uncircumcision. 1 Corinthians 10.32, give none offense neither to the Jew nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God. Those are the three classes of people in this world right now today. A Jew, a Gentile, or the church of God. Amen. And if you're not saved and baptized, you're not part of the church of God, so you're still a Jew or Gentile. Okay, if you're saved and you're not baptized, you're still a Jew or a Gentile because you're not a part of the church of God. Amen. So it's going to be one of those three. That's where you are. And if you are part of the church of God, then all those other um, labels that ha have been before don't matter. Amen. You're not a Jew. You're not a Gentile. You're part of the church of God. Amen. See, that'll help us in this country. Amen. When we, you know, African-American, Mexican-American, Italian-American. No, how about just American? Because you're part of this nation. See, I'm not a Jew. I'm not a Gentile. I'm part of the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
That's what I claim. That's where I'm at. Circumcision, uncircumcision, none of that. Bond free, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. None of it matters. You go back to America when they had slaves. People that understood this, the Baptists that understood this, the, the slaves had the equal treatment within the church. Amen. Why? Because there's no bond, there's no free. We're all equal in here. It's a brotherhood. Amen. So as we teach one another, this is to start with the Word of God. Look at verse 16. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. It starts with the Word of God. This is how we teach one another. Obviously, it should be with the Word of God. Equipped with the Word of God, we're to teach and admonish each other. It says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. To admonish means to counsel against wrong practices. To counsel against wrong practices. To caution or advise. To warn against danger or an offense. That's what we're to do. We're to use the Word of God. Let it dwell in us richly in all wisdom. And then we're to teach and admonish one another. The teaching and admonishment should come through singing too. Look at that. Isn't that interesting? Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. See, there's something to, to singing. It's more than, oh, it's just something we do in church. No, it's to admonish each other. It's to teach each other. It's to help each other. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. This is why corporate worship is so important. What's that? That's what we just did. All of us as a body involved in that. We help each other through that. That's what the Bible says. This is part of the fellowship necessary to keep our body healthy. We're also to exhort and correct one another. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. <clears throat> Hebrews 3.12 Now get this. <clears throat> Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Now who's he talking to? Brethren. Brethren. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, while it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now look, when you look at this at first glance, you're going to look and it's going to be like, man, can you lose your salvation? It's almost what it seems like. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. See, oh, see, there's no belief in departing from the living God. Oh, see, they departed from the living God. Exhort one another, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Look at verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Look at that. If, see, we're made partakers of Christ only if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So can we lose our salvation or what's it talking about? We're, we exhort and correct because we can all fall prey to an evil heart of unbelief which will cause us to depart from God. That's why we exhort and correct one another. Take heed, brethren. He says, watch out. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Now he's talking to saved people and he says, you can have a heart of unbelief. Is that right? Isn't that what it says? 
And in that evil heart of unbelief, it says you can depart from the living God. And what's the example he gives as we jump ahead and we go to a few chapters, a few verses above, I'm sorry. He warns them, verse 15, while it said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation or them provoking God. So don't harden your hearts like they did when, verse 16, for some, when they, when they, had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Why? Because they could not enter in because of unbelief. That's why they couldn't go in. Look, it's talking about departing from Egypt. If we will look at the typology that's given right there in departing from Egypt, what first took place? What was the tenth plague? Somebody help me out. Okay, what do we call it? It was the death of the firstborn, but what the Passover. The Passover. What had to happen? What saved them from death? The blood. The blood had to be applied. And if the blood was applied to the doorposts of their house, the death angel passed over them. Now, what is Egypt a type of? You all help me. Egypt is always a type of the world. So what does he do? Look, you can see the same thing with Christ. He says He called His Son out of where? Egypt. Called Him out of Egypt. What did He do with Israel? He called them out of where? Egypt. So the Passover represents pictures. The Bible says that Christ is our Passover. Okay, that's the blood. Okay, so when He called them out of Egypt... The Passover took place. He called them. That's picturing the salvation. If you understand the typology, that's picturing salvation. So the salvation's taken place is what he's saying. But these people that had salvation had an evil heart of unbelief. Why? We can have an evil heart of unbelief. When we choose not to obey God's word, guess what we all have? An evil heart of unbelief. And that's what those people had. They were saved out of Egypt. They came out. They were with that church in the wilderness. That's what the Bible called it. It was an assembly in the wilderness. But they had an evil heart of unbelief. And God said, because of that, you're not going to enter into my what? Into my rest. None of them got to enter into His rest. Why? Because they had an evil heart of unbelief. So, that evil heart of unbelief can cause us to depart from God. That's what verse 12 says. In departing, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And that's what they did. Now, as we're going to make this application here, we're going to look at it. So, can we lose our salvation then? Depart from the living God? See, I can choose to walk away from God. That's not what it's talking about. The Bible especially the New Testament, knows nothing about a New Testament Christian that is not a part of God's church. It's, it's assumed that somebody that gets saved is going to be a part of God's church. God says, why, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you do what I commanded you? That's God's assumption in all of it. So as we look at this, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. How do we depart from the living God? Through unbelief. We don't believe what His Word says, so we don't do it. So we depart from Him. He says, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now get this, for we are made partakers of Christ. How? How? if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Now, let me back up just a bit. We can have an evil heart of unbelief and that can cause us to depart from God. If you compare that with 2 Peter 1.9, it says, but he that lacketh these things, and it's the things we need to add to our faith and to, to faith, virtue, and to virtue, temperance, and all those things. Okay, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Okay, that's what 2 Peter 1.9 says. Now, the fellowship our church members should have or need should be daily. Look at verse 13. It says, but exhort one another daily. Daily. See, this is what we need. Why? So we don't 
have an evil heart of unbelief and depart from the living God. Okay? And it goes on to say, Why do we exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin? Because our own sin can harden our hearts and we can depart from God. Any one of us within this body. Okay? Now, when God called the children of Israel out, what kind of entity were they? Without me, like, giving you the answer. Who was their ruler? Who ruled them? I don't know, when he called them out. No. God. So what kind of entity was it? It was a theocracy. A kingdom. Okay? They were part of a kingdom with God as the head. Does that sound familiar to us? Okay, the church is a kingdom with who? God as its head. Christ is our head. Okay, so he's exhorting that. He says, exhort one another daily, lest you're hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Okay, so God doesn't want that for us. All right, this is why we need to be in fellowship with each other so we can help each other. The reason we need to be around each other so we can have another set of eyes on our life so we're not hardened through the deceitfulness of sin because sometimes we can lie to ourselves and make us think everything's all right in our own lives, but someone else will look and say, no, uh, you need some help there. Sister, brother, you need some help there. See, th th our own sin will deceive us and we'll harden our own hearts to it and we'll be like, I'm fine, what are you talking about? And it's, it's <laughs> blatantly clear to everybody but us. Okay, that's why we need each other to help each other, to encourage each other, to see some things. Why? So we don't depart from God with an evil heart of unbelief. That's what we don't want to do. Now, as I said, at first glance, it appears we may be able to lose our salvation. But when we understand the kingdom, and if we don't abide in the doctrine, then what does it say in 2 John 9? If we don't abide in the doctrine, we hath not what? We have not God, right? Or we could put it like this, or we're not partakers of Christ. Isn't that what this is saying right here? Look at verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if, wait a minute, that's conditional. Salvation is conditional on me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The only condition is that I call on the name of the Lord. I come to Him in repentance and faith. And then he says He gives me eternal life. But this is something different. Wait, we're made partakers of Christ. What does that mean to be a, a partaker of Christ? It means I take part in. How do I take part in Christ? Help me. Join the body. Amen. Through the baptismal waters. That makes me a partaker of Christ. So, for we are made partakers of Christ, and then what does it say? If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So, we have to do something in order to be a partaker of Christ. That means we have to believe what God says. We have to hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. What? What? To be a partaker of Christ. So, if we don't hold it steadfast unto the end, then what happens? Hey, what did he say? What was the example he gave? As we move farther ahead, verse 17, But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So they'd hardened their hearts through unbelief, although, hey, they had looked to the Lord and trusted Him to, to save them. They put the blood, they did what God said, they had the salvation, so to speak, in typology, and they came out, but they had an evil heart of unbelief, and they didn't obey God and what God said. They would rejected the king and his words. And God's warning us about the very same thing right here, as he, as he says in verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ. Amen. How does that happen? Through baptism. We, get, we enter into His body, into His kingdom. That's how we're made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. What's the beginning of our confidence? What brings us into the body? What brings us into the kingdom? Our baptism. So we have to hold to that doctrine. We can't depart from that. This takes it right back or takes us right forward as we're here in Hebrews 3 to Hebrews chapter 6 to the doctrine of Christ. Which is what? 
those six principles, but baptism's in there. The, and salvation obviously has to come, the, the blood before the water. Okay, so salvation has to come first, but for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So we have to stand in these truths. We have to remain in them. If we don't, then what happens? Well, we won't enter into his rest. But we lose our salvation. That's not what it's saying. What happened? He says, you're not going into the promised land. You're not going into the kingdom. He hadn't given them the land yet. It's, it was the promised land. You guys go take it. They didn't want it. They didn't want the promised land. How many people today don't want what God has promised them? Reject His kingdom. He says, you're not going to enter into my rest. That's what He's warning us about here. Why? So we see, verse 19, that they could not enter in because of unbelief. It's their unbelief. He said, you're not going to enter into my rest. He said, harden not your hearts. Well, how do we prevent hardening our hearts? By exhorting one another, teaching one another, by fellowship. There it is. What is it? Being together in His kingdom. Enjoying it. Enjoying it. My wife and I were talking about the camp meeting, and I said, man, I really enjoyed that. I said, I know it was long days, but I enjoyed it. She said, I didn't think it was very long. She said, but I enjoy being at church. Amen. Amen. I enjoy being here. I like it. I mean, I left tired, but I enjoyed it. Amen. And I didn't think it was long either. I mean, I know we were actually here for a long time, but it didn't feel like that to me because I enjoyed it. We don't enjoy being here because it's here that we can exhort one another. We can encourage one another. I say, oh, don't have an evil heart of unbelief. And we won't word it like that. But we say, watch out for that. Hey, I've noticed you, you're down or whatever it may be, we just talk to somebody about something. We might not even know we do it. We're just having a conversation with them. But we just encouraged them. We exhorted them. And that's what it is. But I just came across this, and this is in studying for this, and it just jumped out at me when I read verse 14. We're made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Wait a minute. That sounds like it's salvation, but no, no. How do we partake of Christ? See, that's why, you know, as we look at that statement, what does it mean to be in Christ? It's to be a part of Him, to be in His body. <clears throat> For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence. <clears throat> it says, so our, our baptism was the beginning of being brought into His house. Hebrews 3.6, we're right there, go ahead and look at it. It says, but Christ is a son over His own house. Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? But there it is again. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. But Christ as a son over his house. Whose house are we? What? Whose house are we? Well, let's go look at 1 Timothy 3.15. Because that fits right there perfectly with that. That makes all of this make sense. It fits it all together. Instead of what typically happens, and I've been guilty of it because I didn't understand some of these things, but you're trying to explain away how that's not teaching you can lose your salvation. But as soon as you understand the kingdom, it, it all begins to fit together. The Bible just starts interlocking with itself, and you say, oh, now it's making sense. Now the cog wheels are all fitting. I get it. Amen. It just, boom, the light bulbs are going off. I'm seeing it now. 1 Timothy 3.15 But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. The house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So the house of God is the church. Verse 6 of Hebrews 3. But Christ is a son over His own house. Well, what is that? The church of the living God. Whose house are we? We're all... Fitly formed together, right? We're part of that body, which every joint supplieth. God puts us in it. We're partakers of it through our baptism. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of our hope, firm unto the end. See, the confidence and the rejoicing of our hope. There it is. We, we get to rejoice in it. It's a good thing. 
Amen. We can exhort each other now. This is a good thing. We can rejoice in all that God did for us. We can rejoice that He made us a part of His house, that He put us in this body, He put us in this kingdom, in this house, all these good things. Man, I get to be a part of God's house. Amen. I like that. That's what we get to be a part of. We get to rejoice in that. It's our baptism that makes us partakers of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 17. For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. It's talking about being put into the body of Christ. How does that happen? I think everybody here knows it happens through baptism. Acts chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into the body of Christ. Galatians 3, 27, same thing. We're, it's through our baptism that it puts us into Christ. In Christ. Let's look at Galatians 3 real quick. I'm going to just read it when I get there. If you get there, great. If not, I'm going to read it anyway. Galatians 3, 27. For as many of you as have been baptized, here it is, into Christ, have put on Christ. There it is. We're put into Christ. Through what? Baptism. Baptism puts us into Christ. Ephesians 3, 6 says this, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs uh oh, here it is. And of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the gospel. There it is. See, the Gentiles also get to be a part of it. Colossians 1, 12 and 13. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And here it is. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. That's what happened. How? Because we're partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. We're partakers of Christ, and He's delivered us from the power of darkness. And here's what He did. He translated us from the kingdom uh, of, of Satan into the kingdom of His dear Son. See, there's been a, a, a transplanting that's taken place. We've been from the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of God. Because who's the God of this world? Satan. And what did Jesus say? You see bumper stickers with it all over the place, and they don't even know what it means. The N-O-T-W. Not of this world. They don't understand it. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So when we go through those waters, a dead man, or we come up raised a new man, we're put into that body. And we're translated from that kingdom, the kingdom of Satan, into the kingdom of his dear son. There's a translation. By the way, let me just throw this out at you. I think it's twice that the word translated is used in the Bible. And every time what was translated is better than the original. Think about that with the King James Bible. All right. Our confidence is to continue to abide in Him, so we're not ashamed at His coming. So it talks about that there. It says, verse 6, But Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So our confidence is to continue to abide in Him, so we're not ashamed at His coming. Go to 1 John 2.28. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. This is going to help us here with the men's meeting on Sunday. And now little children, abide in Him that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. That we can have confidence. See, as we abide in Him, we're not ashamed when He comes. Let's also look at Romans 14.10. Now, there's more that I could get into with all of this, but Romans 14.10. <clears throat> Again, Hebrews 3.14, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. And then 1 John 2.28, And now, little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. So what do we do? We need to abide in Him, or we need to hold fast, uh, hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast. And now Romans 14.10 says, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
And we don't want to stand there ashamed, do we? So what do we need to do? We need the fellowship of the brethren so we can exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. I want to enter into His rest. I want to stand before the Lord and hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't want to be like the Israelites that could not enter in because of their unbelief. Not be a part of His kingdom. That's what it was. They didn't get to be a part of the kingdom how He wanted it in the promised land because of unbelief. Because they didn't obey God. Because they didn't hold fast or hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. They didn't do that. we got to hold it fast, steadfast unto the end. It's, you know, Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, because I've done that, there's laid up a crown for me. You make it all the way to the end and quit at the end, guess what? You didn't hold it steadfast unto the end. And we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now we're talking about saved people here. Not lost people, but saved people. And there's consequences for saved people that don't hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. We won't enter into His rest. His kingdom. It's a lot more serious than most of us have been made to believe. There's more to it than we've thought, Amen. than I've thought. Amen. I can tell you that, and I'll tell you now, too, I don't have all the answers. I'm still studying and learning. I mean, this thing just opened up to me today as I was studying it. And I thank God for it. I've got more to learn. <laughs> we all do. But it's not the cut and dried as we've been made to believe that so the, the faithful that, that serve God and live for Him all their life, get the same reward as the unfaithful, but who are still saved? That's not what we read right here. That's not the example that's given to us right here. See, here's the, when we get bad doctrine, this messes up everything. When you believe that the kingdom's all yet future, well then, what does this mean? What do I, lose my salvation? That has to be what it means. But we know the Bible doesn't teach that, so how does it fit? When you understand the kingdom, that the kingdom is now... There it is. Here, let me read you something. <clears throat> this was from Edward Hiscox in Principles and Practices of Baptist for Baptist Churches. Okay, I think it was written in the mid 1800s to the, the late 1800s, I forget. But here's what he says. He's talking about a Christian church, chapter 2, the meaning of the word. And I'm going to skip down and not read through everything he said, but here's what he said. Church, this word is used to designate the visible kingdom of heaven on earth. Church, it's used to designate the visible kingdom of heaven on earth. It's been believed in the past. It was forgotten, sucked up through Protestant doctrine. And we lost the, this truth. I'm not saying everyone did. People had it, but for the most part, it was gone. But there it is, plain as day, and the Bible starts making sense now. Now, everything's fitting together just like it should. So, are we, since we're made partakers of Christ, are we going to hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end? Are you? You say, well, I want to. How do I do that? Preventive discipline. The fellowship. We need it because we can exhort one another to not have an evil heart of unbelief. Evil evil. Go to 2 John 9. It's amazing how so much of this just fits. An evil heart of unbelief is what it was said. 2 John 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Now get this, if there come 
any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is, here's the word again, partaker, partaker of his evil deeds. Good. Evil deeds. Evil deeds. So do we want to be a partaker of evil deeds? Do we want an evil heart of unbelief? How? By rejecting what God says? By rejecting His doctrine. That, that's it. It's not talking about you lost your salvation. You've rejected His doctrine. You have an evil heart of unbelief. If any, uh, For he that biddeth him Godspeed, who? Those that don't abide in this doctrine is a partaker of His evil deeds. And if we have an evil heart of unbelief, then we haven't held our confidence steadfast unto the end. Fits with 1 John 2.28, And now, little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. How much shame would there be if we had that evil heart of unbelief and we didn't abide in His doctrine, and then He shows up and we we're ashamed because we rejected Him. We didn't believe what He said. We didn't hold to it. It was through the deceitfulness of sin, that evil heart of unbelief, we departed from the living God. That's apostasy. To depart from the living God. So we need each other. To exhort each other. To faith, to belief. To hold that confidence steadfast unto the end. Now put yourself here in a situation. Imagine if there's really some persecution going on. I'm telling you, we, we got it like patty cake today, man. Baker's man. I mean, it's easy today. I'm telling you right now. I get it. We all have things come into life and, and where we're at, it is hard. I'm not saying that it's not. But when we look at the reality of, man, we are so blessed in this nation. We have, have it so easy. Now imagine if there was real persecution taking place and we're having to meet in secret. And I mean, it's like we can be arrested. We can be taken from our children, split up from our children. And now, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, boy, that takes on a little bit stronger meaning now, doesn't it? Husbands and wives are having to go to the, the church meetings separate. Just in case they rate it so you're both not arrested and the children are left to fend for themselves. That's re the reality of what's happened. That's what people have done. People are still doing in underground churches. We don't have to live with that. But if we did, imagine how much more this means. An evil heart of unbelief. Well, I just can't do that. I, I, I can't risk being arrested. I'm sorry, I can't, I, I, I can't fellowship with you guys anymore. I can't be a part of that body anymore. You know what you did then? God just said, you're not going to enter into my rest because you have an evil heart of unbelief and you have departed from the living God. And you haven't held the beginning of your confidence steadfast unto the end. See, it's not always easy. We've got it pretty easy. Don't let the sniffles keep you from being here. Amen. Don't let an out-of-town family member keep you from being here. Amen. Hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Let's pray. Father, we love you.